This course is about introducing you to an alternative economic paradigm and modeling framework. In order to facilitate our discussion, in this video we'll be starting the course off by talking about economic theories, science and paradigms in general. This will help to essentially define the problem space that different economic theories will have to try and solve. Because at the end of the day, all these theories and paradigms may be different, but they're all using the same building blocks of science and theory to try and describe economic phenomena. So we'll be firstly talking about what theories and paradigms are and providing a little insight into their basic workings before moving on to define this subject that we call economics. From this definition, we'll go on to outline some of the major considerations involved in the study of economics, including trying to understand the basic logic behind the decision-making of agents, theories of economic value, the dynamics of cooperation and competition, economic institutions and economic development. We're starting the course off with this discussion around the bigger picture of economics and science in general, because the domain of economics aspires to be a science but its status as a science is sometimes brought into question. So part of what we'll be doing in this module and coming videos, we'll be trying to give some outline to what it means to be a scientific domain. In order to understand something in a coherent fashion, we need to create a model of it. If we want to try and understand something very complex like a national or even global economy, these models are going to involve a very high level of abstraction. An abstraction is a compact representation of a system that removes successive layers of detail in order to capture the underlying structure and function of the system. Theories are conceptual, abstract models. All theories rest upon a set of assumptions. Nobody likes the term assumption, particularly not in science. But the fact is that we can't question everything all of the time. We can, in practice, only question some things some of the time. And in order to do this, we need to start from something that we consider self-evident. These assumptions are what we call axioms in mathematics, which is a premise so evident as to be accepted as truth without question by the theory. A coherent set of assumptions might be called a paradigm. You can't question the paradigm from within the theory, because the theory is made of the paradigm. Within science, theories may be formalized by encoding them into a formal language. A formal language that most people are familiar with might be algebra, but there are many other kinds of formal languages. By formalizing theories in this way, it is possible that they may be passed by machines, meaning we can put them into computer code and harness the power of computation, which is very beneficial, particularly when we're dealing with very complex systems. So all economic theories are going to do this. They're going to use some paradigm, that is a set of assumptions, in order to build a theory that will describe some empirical phenomena considered part of the domain of economics. If they are successful, they may or may not go on to formalize this within a formal language that would give them a certain rigor and endow it with computability. We'll also note that no theory is going to be perfect, but some will be more internally consistent, have greater rigor, be more efficient, and better able to match the data than others. Because all models are not perfect, they will have a life cycle, meaning we should always be working on developing better ones and retiring old ones once we have these new models developed. Of course, this is not an orderly process, it is a very messy one in practice, but this evolutionary process is necessary for the science to develop and grow. As an example of this, we might think about the current situation within theoretical physics of what is called the standard model, which is a model to the fundamental particles of matter and their interactions, sometimes called the theory of almost everything. Although it has many achievements, this nickname is attribute to its limitations in not being able to fully describe some very important empirical phenomena surrounding gravity and the expanding universe among others. The standard model is both used day in and day out by researchers and also recognized as likely being just a stepping stone to a more fundamental and more inclusive model that researchers are at the same time working on under the name of the theory of everything. The point here is to simply recognize when a model is incomplete and to make that explicit. The enterprise of science involves 
trying to interpret the world by developing models that have internal logical consistency and matching these to data. If we are engaged in an empirical science, objective empirical data should ultimately have the last say on everything. As long as the data is accurate, if the world doesn't fit into our model, this is not a problem with the world, it is a problem with our model. Science will develop and grow most effectively when we're able to admit the limitations to our models and accept whichever ones work best as the current standard. Because, at the end of the day, science performs an important function within modern society. That function is to stay developing these models, providing society with the best tools to appropriately interpret empirical phenomena. If we can match models to data and everything is working, then we can hand them out to society with the appropriate warning signs on the side of the tin. Now that we've given some definition to what we mean by the term theory and the general enterprise of science, we'll begin to define what we mean when we refer to the domain of economics. There is no widely accepted formal definition for the domain of economics, but one of the most quoted definitions to economics is from the English economist Leon Robbins, who defined economics as, quote, the science which studies human behavior as a relationship between given ends and the scarce means which have alternative uses. On this most basic level, economics is defined as the study of how people use efficient means to achieve valued ends. From this perspective, economics is about how we choose to spend any available resource, such as our time or effort, in trying to achieve other things that we value more highly. This is, of course, not just on the micro level of the individual, but also on the macro level, that is to say how organizations and society at large uses scarce resources to produce valuable commodities and distributes them among the people. To flesh out our definition a bit further, we might say economics is the study of individual choice in the allocation of resources and how these micro-level actions interact to give rise to macro-level patterns of economic organization. The manifestation of all this activity is what we call an economy, consisting of natural resources, technology, social and economic institutions. Out of this definition, we can draw a number of central areas of interest that any economic theory is going to have to give some basic description to. These fundamental aspects of economics are typically broken down into micro and macro. On the micro level, we need some account of these agents that are performing the act of economizing in the pursuit of their ends. We'll also need some description for what we mean by this idea of economic value, as this is clearly central to the whole enterprise we'll need to take account of the fact that these agents are inevitably going to interact and these interactions are going to be another key part of the whole dynamic. And this is all happening on the micro level, which will inevitably lead to enduring macro scale patterns of organization, such as whole economies. Thus, we'll need to develop some model to these macro scale phenomena. And lastly, this whole system is going to be changing over time and we'll be interested in trying to model the patterns within this dynamic. We'll spend the rest of this module discussing each of these areas separately. In most definitions of economics, the idea of scarcity is fundamental. That is to say that the resources that are being allocated are not infinite. There is some limit to their availability. Maybe a better way to put this is simply to say that there will always be a hierarchy of values. On aggregate, there will always be some things that we value more than others. Because we can't have everything, we have to make choices as to how we allocate our resources. We have to choose some things over others. As such, an economic framework will need some description as to the logic under which economic agents act and make choices with respect to the allocation of their resources in pursuing their ends. Economic agents wish to achieve their valued ends and economize in trying to achieve this. This is not to say that they will always try to maximize their total economic or financial value. This is clearly not the case. People sometimes take lower paid jobs because of work satisfaction or other factors, but they opt for this choice because it gives them the greatest overall value. Thus, we're using an abstraction where we're talking about value of any kind, social, cultural, financial, ecological, etc. This helps to illustrate how economics is not really about money, products, or capital. 
It is an abstract way of representing human behavior in terms of means and ends, based upon the assumption that humans will strive for the highest valued ends at the lowest cost means. In so doing, they perform the act of economizing. This basic premise that people will adopt the most efficient means to achieving their highest valued ends is not a particular economic theory or paradigm. It is part of the very fabric of the subject of economics. But different paradigms will go on to define value in different ways, some expansive and some reductive. This fact that there is scarcity and a hierarchy of outcomes leads us to the idea of value. The concept of value is one of the deepest and most complex concepts within all of the social sciences. The theory of value is a term that encompasses all economic theories that try to define what economic value is, where it comes from, and how to quantify it through some objective metric, what we might call a price. There are two fundamentally different conceptions of value within economic theory, one intrinsic and the other extrinsic. Intrinsic value is the value of a product that comes from its inputs. Intrinsic value theory holds that the value of some commodity is inherent to it. That value is objective in that it is independent from any person's individual evaluation of it. And thus, from this perspective, value is seen to be absolute. Extrinsic value can be seen as a value that is ascribed to a commodity due to the perception of social actors. Extrinsic value is a measure of the benefit provided by a product or service to an economic agent. Extrinsic value is captured in the concept of utility. It represents satisfaction experienced by some consumer of a good. A good then has value in that it satisfies human wants. Put very simply, from this perspective, no absolute metric to value exists for any good or service except its price, which is a reflection of a demand and supply position and not any inherent quality of that item. These economic agents will, during the course of their actions, come into contact with each other. That is to say, they will inevitably interact. Through these interactions, agents may find that they share common pursuits and by working together, they can achieve these ends more efficiently than in isolation. Thus, they may work together by differentiating their activities with respect to each other, while all the time coordinating these activities towards the common end. In so doing, they will become interdependent. We call this type of interaction cooperation, and it is a fundamental type of social interaction. Inversely, these agents may find that their interests are in fact mutually exclusive. The end goal of one agent's economic activity may be some finite resource that is the end goal of another's, and both of these agents want as much of this resource as they can possibly attain, given its finite nature. In such a case, we may well get a second type of fundamental social interaction, what is called competition. Also, we may get some form of both, what is called co-opetition, a more complex dynamic involving elements of cooperation and competition. All of these different dynamics are studied within the area of game theory that we'll be discussing in later modules. All of these interactions between agents are going to produce some enduring patterns that become solidified into what are called economic institutions. The idea of an institution is one of the basic concepts within all of social science. Wikipedia has a good definition for a social institution. Quote, institutions are stable, valued, reoccurring patterns of behavior. As structures or mechanisms of social order, they govern the behavior of a set of individuals. Examples of economic institutions are financial markets, corporations, banks, pension funds, insurance companies, and all kinds of special purpose vehicles, amongst many others. These institutions facilitate specific interactions by defining a set of rules so that rules don't have to be reinvented and renegotiated for every agent, for every new choice, or for every new interaction. These institutions enable automatic, well-defined behavior and interactions that facilitates the coordination of economic activity. These enduring patterns that we call institutions are composed essentially of nothing more than the coordinated choices made by individual agents their submission to follow predefined protocols, but they become embodied within abstract principles and rules that both enable and constrain the individual agents within the institution. 
If economic institutions are just the aggregation of the choices made by the agents, then a key consideration is how are these choices aggregated and distributed out? That is to say, what is the structure to the institution? Is this aggregation of choices concentrated within a small subset of the overall system, which would give it a centralized structure, such as a monopolistic market or a command and control economy? Or is it more distributed, such as an oligopolistic market? Or is it fully distributed, such as a pure market, where producers and consumers have the freedom to make their own economic decisions? These different institutional structures will, in turn, give rise to very different properties to the overall system and a different response to the question of macro-level resource allocation. The last major subset of questions we'll be interested in asking and any major economic paradigm will have to try and answer is that of economic dynamics. Economic dynamics is a study of how the structure and makeup to the economic system changes over time. At the end of the day, what we're really doing here is what we're always doing in science, asking are there patterns in the time series data to the state of the economy and what logically consistent model can we create to match those patterns? This time series data is, of course, giving us a snapshot of the macro state to the system at any given time. A macro scale economy, like that of a nation, involves many interacting parts, from demographics to education, to employment, to international trade, to government policy, to corporate management, to the availability of capital in the financial markets, and so on. Our theory will want to give some basic overall model of how these macro-level subsystems interact and how do they give rise to the overall state of the system at any time. If we remember back to our definition, this whole economic project is about striving for more of what we define as valuable. In a certain sense then, this whole enterprise of economics is set up to grow. But that idea of what growth means can be defined in different ways. Is it simply getting more of the things we value, as in more cars, more houses, more holidays, etc.? Or is it getting things of a higher value and quality? That is to say, instead of buying more watches, I switch to a Rolex watch. Thus, instead of getting more of something, I have moved up the value chain. And this moving up the value chain is one form of economic development. The end result of both of these will be greater total value, which we could define as growth. But they are both very different ways of achieving it, with very different consequences. At the end of the day, we want our model to aid us in reasoning about such questions as how do economies grow, why and when do they go into recession? Is there such a thing as distinct and objective economic stages of development, and if so, what are they? And with respect to policy, how can we manage the system in order to achieve this development in an equitable and sustainable fashion? In this module, we've been taking an overview to economic theory by talking first about the nature of abstraction and paradigms, discussing how theories are conceptual forms of abstraction that when rationalized may be encoded within a formal language. Recognizing there is no formal definition to the domain of economics, we laid down a working definition based around the conception of economics as the study of individual choice in the allocation of resources towards some valued end, and how these micro-level actions interact, giving rise to macro-level patterns of economic organization. From this definition, we went on to outline some of the major considerations involved in the study of economics including trying to understand the logic behind the decision-making of agents, theories of economic value, and the idea of intrinsic and extrinsic value. We briefly touched upon different types of interaction between agents in terms of cooperation and competition. We discussed economic institutions with a quick look at their structure. Lastly, we talked about economic dynamics, the area of economics that tries to model and understand the behavior of economies over time.